Good afternoon, everyone. This is Krishna Chaitanya Yegari, KC. Uh, I'm a specialist customer engineer working for Google, uh, based out of New York. I'm here to talk about ML mindset for managers. Uh, I have you know, been working with uh, enterprise customers for quite a while now. I've had experience over 13 years uh, architecting solutions, uh, building solutions, hands-on, everything from end to end. So in this session, we're going to take, I'm going to talk about my experiences in terms of what it makes or what 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 it makes uh, good for having what kind of mindset you need to have if you wanted to start an ML project in your company. Now, what is that we're going to do in this session? We focus on, first of all, what is machine learning? I just wanted to bring everyone on the same page here. I think I don't want to go into deep dive into what is machine learning and the basics of it, but just as an introductory, understand what ML all about. How different is machine learning from normal software development? I wanted to talk about that because that's a mindset which you, which your developers would be having, uh, which as a manager, you need to be understanding uh, to understand the different phases of what it takes to build a machine learning model. I'll also take you through how to represent physical problems in data. Like you have so many problems in your company. How do you think what is the mindset or what is the cap you need to wear to take that physical problem and understand, represent that in form of data. And then we will talk about do stones and what to focus. That's exactly our point of discussion. And I'll, I'll, I'll conclude by what should be you thinking as a manager in your products. Now, this is a standard definition of machine learning. If you go ahead and see, it's a study of computer algorithms that improve automatically. Now, the important part is this is derived from Wikipedia, nothing fancy here, but important things of which I wanted to you to high, understand here is few things. These are algorithms that improve automatically or through experience. I'll talk about that. This is a subset of artificial intelligence. These are there when you don't, I mean, these particularly are models or so algorithms where you are predicting something without being explicitly programmed. I'll talk about that. That's an important thing which you need to be understanding about machine learning. And it is also somewhere it's it's you apply machine learning when difficult when 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 you have solutions or when you have tasks where it's infeasible or difficult to develop con conventional algorithms for the requirements you have at place. So very important these points which we will be keeping on talking as we go in the session further but try to let uh, memorize these because I think this, this will help us aid in our discussion. Now, on a high level, artificial intelligence is something where it talks about or learns about all the programs that learn and reasons like human beings. Machine learning is a small sub subset within that where we are talk talking about studying the algorithms which can, which can learn by itself without being explicitly programmed. Deep learning is again based on a concept called artificial neural networks that learn and adapt from vast, vast data. So uh, this, 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 this is a big picture of what machine learning differentiates itself from artificial intelligence and deep learning, how it is associated. Now, quick, quick question to you all. I know I cannot uh, uh, see your chat, but a quick question to you all is, how do you learn your native language? When we were born, we typically have two options to learn your native language. You, I give you a dictionary, you learn it. I give you like all the dictionaries and usage and grammar and ask you to learn it. The second one, which typically, I mean, this, this will never work. Even if you try to learn it, it takes years and years because that's not how we are adapted. Now, how we are adapted as human beings, we typically learn by examples. Your mom teaches you saying that, hey, this is how the word looks like. This is how uh, rhymes are there. And we, we, we are trying to be adapt to more and more examples as we go. Now imagine, the same goes with any pictorial representation. You see an animal with long nose and ears and a tail. And your mom, when, when you're a kid, tells you that, hey, that's a dog. You understand that's a dog. You know, how do you, you kind of have your brain which you know creates a memory of what dogs look like and imagine the next day a fox comes and you try to touch it your mom will say i mean she slaps you and say hey that's a fox that's not a dog but you try to understand what's the difference between what is this nuance between dog and a fox it has 
obviously the same kind of nose ears and for tail the teeth might be different so what you're trying to do is you're trying to reduce the error in your brain to identify a dog versus a fox so all of what you do in your life is to reduce that errors what is the truth how i can go with that or with data available and your brain is actually processed or created in such a way that it takes the memory footprint and try to reduce the errors as we go further now that's exactly what we do mostly that's a kind of thought process which goes into machine learning by the way this session is more intended on the strategy of employing your machine learning not in details about what is exactly ml because i think uh, that's a discussion for another day now if you look at and employ that same logic to a common problem which you always face explicitly writing programs to understand if a mail contains is a spam or not you can raise if else conditions there is nothing wrong here if you look at this if else condition is perfectly valid you are not doing anything wrong but the point is if you keep on doing this all of us will get mail next day because there is no way you can actually capture all the spam logic or the requirements in an if else condition even though you try a conventional program it doesn't work now what is an alternative and best approach to do that maybe if you think out of box the best other alternative approach is going and understanding hey let's classify some emails and change one self basically what i'm doing is and try to reduce the errors when we are trying to classify and we keep on repeating that until that the reduce the error rate is within a limit which is adaptable which is okay to actually use that so this is how we kind of think in machine learning language or that's a mindset of an ml developer where if he says this is how a traditional programming looks like and how it differentiates to machine learning here now quick differentiation if you are in a company a large scale company you will see this more often bi and reporting is more descriptive in nature machine learning is more predictive in nature when it talks about sophistication obviously there is a lot more sophisticated that uh, which which you are going to do in machine learning now let's quickly jump and understand the power and what it takes to be now uh, this is a research paper where the bunch of research scientists played atari you know atari game this is based in like deep learning scientists actually started playing uh, you know training or playing atari games using reinforcement learning so if you look at i mean this this paper is online you can actually search for it but what we are going to talk about is how impactful is machine learning or what is the use cases that trying to solve you might have all seen this game this is atari breakout game now what it does is if you the 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 research paper talks about a situation where the pixels on the screen are given as an input and the paddle on the down is something which is predicted the position of the paddle is predicted as part of how the game is actually being played now it's a combination of conventional neural network trained with a variant of q learning and obviously it it's more of a reinforcement learning and conventional neural network which is at play here now the whole point is can the paddle the down paddle be accurately placed or you know kind of actually predicted the where the paddle goes if we keep on actually giving input as the screen here the pixel as a screen here now with 10 minutes what they observed is it's a random like always the paddle fails with no signs of intelligence and as in when it is playing with itself in 120 minutes a flawless play started it's actually competing like as if a normal human being is playing here now the next level to this is with 240 minutes a strategy emerged the strategy here is if we break up the ball if the ball breaks up the wall the corner of a wall the game is over it actually breaks up everything this is a strategy which was not there before like point in time this this strategy was unknown and it was uncovered when the variations of this game is being played by a combination of conventional neural networks and uh, uh, reinforcement learning now the whole point here is i mean obviously they started playing all the games and tried 
and, and, and saw that it's the, the reinforcement learning is much more accurate and it's being actually performing above human level. So it kind of bring to a point that all these uh, uh, models or machine learning is going to give you an advantage or uncovers something in your programs, which are in your solution, which is something which you never have thought of or known before. Now, to suffice, what we are doing is we are solving problems without knowing how explicitly creating a solution for it. Now, there are so many use cases to this. I don't want to go deep dive into all these use cases, but yes, there is a section of use cases where machine learning can be applied. Now, how it is different from being an ML software? This is where things I wanted to like talk about and take my time here. This is a very important topic of discussion. Imagine you're a person who wanted to go for a coffee, take a coffee. Like you go and search in your application, coffee shop near me, or you wanted to decide which coffee shop is near to you. There are two coffee shops, three minutes walking, you get coffee shop X, five minutes walking, you get coffee shop Y. Which one you choose? Or if I am an application, if I wanted to give you a search result, or if I wanted to give you an application which suggests you which coffee shop you need to go, how would I do it? There are so many variations here. Is the quality of coffee shop X is better than Y? Or is it like you need coffee shop Y? I mean, you are regular to coffee shop Y. If it is five minutes walk, you can actually bear with it. Or imagine a situation where you have a bridge in between coffee shop Y and you, but you love coffee shop Y. Do you really want it to go there? These are all hard problems to solve. How would you decide which one to go for? Now, the solution to this is instead of you being judgmental and saying that, hey, this guy might like actually coffee shop Y because he's been there for a long time because the bridge is actually a barrier, he cannot walk. So instead of you concluding this, maybe the best option for you is to start with understanding, imagine, let's take Coffee Shop X. How does his experience change with the distance if he's always trying to go for X? This is how you need to, first of all, understand the data, how his experience with X changes with the distance based on how he traveled. Now, all you just need to do is take all the data, put it on a diagram, put it on a graph. You're not doing anything here. All you're just doing is mark how his experience, how user happiness here is changing with respect to uh, the, the distance he's traveling when he wanted to travel to Coffee Shop X. Now, once you plot this diagram or graph, all you see is, you see a pattern emerging here. If you keenly observe the, pa the, pa the pattern here is, you are trying to be in a place where coffee shop X is, if, if you're traveling a lot of distance, it clearly indicates that you are actually not happy. Now, if you look at this situation and this situation, you, your user happiness is not improved even though the distance is less. So how do you do it? Now, the best way you can actually try doing it is draw a straight line. Can be one of the options. The trend is if you draw a straight line and observe, and you can find out a pattern of how his user happiness is actually being trained. If you reduce the time, uh, the, the distance, your happiness is increasing, which is perfectly fine. But there are scenarios where which are off the graph. There is so much, it's, it's, it's actually giving you so much error, which means there will be some scenarios which cannot be predicted, but that prediction will give you a, a very big error, which impact your experience in the product. So your job is, yes, you found out a pattern, but how do you reduce this error? Now, if you understand like calculus and, and, and mathematics, this is more of a linear model. The problem with this model is it's too rigid or underfitting because the error here is obviously very high. Now, maybe if I'm being, you know, a little smart and try to create or build up a graph which is connecting everything, like it's a curvy line which is almost connecting. 
what you're trying doing here is you're trusting the data too much you're exactly saying this guy actually is not happy when the distance is 3 km it, it doesn't look that way there is no pattern here in this case it's actually too flexible or overfitting now what would be the right solution maybe if you draw a smooth line the distance or the curve between these two kind of actually is is reduced increased or as we go further the the experience obviously drops down but the experience is quite high if the distance is quite small so this is kind of a good learning which you wanted to have in your product like what we did we understood the user data and translated that data to a graph or understood the data found out a pattern which is what something we are missing or we didn't know that and tried to come up with a, a pattern of which might look like what is that going to look like in future or what is the path which we need to take if i wanted to give him most user happiness so this is how a typical uh, machine learning scientist would actually think when he's building any product now few learnings out of it the first learning obviously it's smooth monotonic respects examples it should not be quite linear but doing all the right things machine learning is all about good parenting so if the data is wrong obviously your data output is wrong if you are giving bad examples you get bad examples out and i mean it's garbage in garbage out and uh, if you give the right examples and flexibility you will get the right model out of it so three things important which in 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 machine learning is obviously data algorithm and insights now let's talk about managers by the way i'm going to show you quite two of demos as we go further uh, i'll take your questions i cannot see what questions are being asked but i'll take questions as soon as i switch to demos i'll have some time there now let's talk about mindset with what kind of mindset as a manager or a cx or a product manager you need to have while you are incorporating machine learning into your models or in your product the first one i would definitely talk about is Oh, there are so many to cover. By the way, I, I'll go one by one. I'll take you through all of them, and I'll pause after these two slides, and then take some questions. The first one is obviously, don't be afraid to launch your product without machine learning. By the way, the first one, I'll give you an example. When I wanted to build an e-commerce website, and when I wanted to show recommendations for products you wanted to buy, or search, I mean, list out all the products based on your preference. on the day one i don't need to really do machine learning all i just need to is maybe try to do an alphabetical order of showing listing out all the products simple i'm not trying to be fancy i'm just putting alphabetical order like for example i'm building a streaming service like netflix i just put the most viewed uh, videos on the home page i don't really customize that on the day one so don't be afraid of launching your product but one thing which you need to be very sure is you need to identify which are the problems customized for machine learning which you cannot use traditional programming methods the best example i would say is what is the view time if you are building some portal like netflix a streaming portal the view time or what is the next video you need to promote or show to make sure that all uh, the user continuously watches it that's a problem which is not something traditional programming models can solve so you need to have that idea of list of problems on the day one to understand and use machine learning models for the reason you need to take those inputs to kind of build heuristics into your application so your application has to be properly you know kind create logs and heuristics which are distinct and designed to make sure that you are to, you you have the solution to your problem as we go further now the third thing is it's not just about predictions you are not trying to say okay this this might be a probable video which the person choose to see that's not how it looks like you need to aim for a decision yes i understand i wanted to bring out a video or a, you know which video wanted to watch but what is that i'm going to do with that maybe i'll build a recommendation bar and suggest that on the top of the list or i maybe i'll actually make that clickable onto the video link so there are decisions which actually impact here rather than the predictions which obviously are there which you wanted to achieve the next one is 
choose machine learnings when there is a complex and unmaintainable heuristic for example popularity of a product launched is combination and complex or popularity of any new movie coming out is always complex now look into those areas where you have unmanageable and complex heuristics to choose machine learning now the next important the fifth point obviously where you need to focus on is you don't need to always worry about the data i'll give you an example for that in a while but the point is you don't need to worry for the data there are so many internal and external data sources within your own infrastructure your team logs your clickstream data your product logs your customer interaction data which you actually understand from a lot of application logs all that will aid your application those are the input log and very important you need to also get your infrastructure right to make sure that all the logs are collected from the day one if your infrastructure to manage this in machine learning models is not right it's going to be a problem as we go further and build bigger and bigger models which requires petabytes of data now having just merely the data is not important not 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 the end of it you need to transform that filter that and and there is a saying that if the data is beyond 6 months or 7 months i think the data is not useful anymore so you have to have a real time processing engine in your own application which kind of transforms this data normalize massage this with existing external data sources and make sure that the data is ready so by the way there are outside data sources in a lot of open source data sources uh, in in in, in kaggle and other external sources where you can take advantage of it for example if you wanted to imagine uh, understand which plays a uh, yeah bit by the way bitcoin entire transactional data is out in the market it's 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 public now what you can also do with that is i'm just throwing an idea out is take the data put it into a data source or a warehouse search it and understand what is the first ever transaction recorded in bitcoin how much transactions are happening and what is the areas of uh, transactions which people are using bitcoin for maybe launch your application in those areas to make sure that you take advantage of it one of the use cases or when you say i wanted to hire a person who is very good at java now where do you find good java people with good java experience maybe stack overflow data is actually out in public take that and understand just search for it and see uh, where from which place i mean i'm just throwing it out uh, you know massage that data with external ip data and see where in which areas people are actually answering a lot of java questions and and go to that area and do your hiring and if you wanted to use any open source application in your project which application obviously is most reliable which has more contributors search on github data github data gives you insights on which is has more contributors obviously kubernetes has today a lot more contributors so you can you can get all these insights from external data sources which can be combined with your existing data sources so build your data model in the initial days to make sure that you're taking advantage of all these insights which you are never thought of and you have to have a baseline heuristic so baseline heuristics is directly dependent on what kind of problems you're trying to solve now when you launch on the launch date make sure that you implement all the metrics in your product you should you should have your logging uh, for example in this case i wanted to say which video user watch next you should be able to understand the watch time and the video content classification of these videos all that has to be implemented in your product to get that experience into into your data source so i'll just pause here maybe take a question if you have any uh, i'll just check questions once excellent looks like uh, there is no question let let me continue so second one is once you have your application ready and open identify the predictive power so what is a predictive power here means i'll give you a small example i started a company a startup and you also started a startup now tell me both of us are in a business of predicting which horse will win in a horse race now why do an investor invest in me versus over you or why should a company actually give me an offer versus over you now the point is there are so many examples to this i can say you can say i have the latest data available you can say i have the 
old data available, I have the best resources available. The point is all these variables can be changed. For example, you have the best resource, maybe I can, he can actually join my company or you have the best data. You can, I can also acquire the data or procure the data or find some ways to actually get the live stream data out of it. So all the things which make predicting a horse race win always are interchangeable. Like you can always be a point where I have a lead sometimes and you have a lead. Now what changes the entire outcome? Imagine I went to a Stanford or a premier university, fund a research and found out that a eye of a horse, the, the water on the eye of a horse is actually, uh, it can give me a better insight on the horse health and the stamina of the horse. That's something which you might not have. That is a feature which you might not be even knowing. So if I include that feature, maybe my advantage is I have better options to get more details out of it or more, more predictability out of it. So identify the product predictive power with the features in your product. I'm going to show you a demo of these features on how they impact the way the prediction actually changes and works. Now, once you have the features ready, you need to be having an ideal outcome. What is your ideal outcome? You need to be answering. You should be knowing that my ideal outcome is the horse win, or at least the third one, two, three, top three horses, or the time limit. So you need to have some ideal outcome to test it beforehand. And you need to also have a success and failure metrics of the model if it is performing good or not. Sometimes whatever it comes out of machine learning looks good because that is something you trust it and you don't know what it is. But you should be having some test validations. Like for example, someone need to say, I, I always encounter this problem where you talk about how the pricing has to be changing, like the, the, the variable pricing for uh, cabs. So how do I charge a customer in the morning to evening? So there should be some validation where people already knowing that would be able to validate your pricing beforehand to make sure that whatever you're doing is right or wrong. So have some failure metrics and success metrics for your model beforehand. And that's like the next one is have good output, which is directly connected to your outcome. So make sure that you're taking decisions and the decisions are impacting how it is uh, how your input is being accessed. And last few steps are very, very important. Don't, uh, I would say bias is the biggest enemy of machine learning. And, and, and people are combating that like every day. So make sure that you don't trust machine learning as on the face value of it. Have humans in loop. Make sure that you are validating your model every day. Uh, make sure that there is a validation in checks where humans decide some of the gates where the machine learning is performing in the right way or not. For example, you might all see where you'll see a thumbs up and the thumbs down for every suggestion you get in for machine learning, whether you like the solution or not. So you're taking a constant feedback here from the audience or the users or the humans and understanding and readjusting your machine learning. Machine learning is all about experimentation. It doesn't stop as in when you build a model. It's evolving as if we humans are evolving in terms of learning something new every day. Now, freshness of the system is paramount important. And uh, the reason if it is an old data which changes like a decade data, which is changing the way your narrative is, there is no point in having that in your system and using it for machine learning. So understand what is the freshness of your requirements and play with that, play with that data around. And, and obviously, last three steps are mostly for testing. Make sure that you export data. I mean, test the data models before exporting. Remember that you are not the typical end user. Always have a third eye or a third person or an agency testing your models thoroughly as if a third person, because all these biases are the main problems of your product not performing well. And always plan to launch and iterate continuously as we go further. So just to summarize, First of all, don't be afraid of launching a product without ML. Solve, understand your problem very, very well. Identify your data sources. There is enough data already available in the market. Take advantage of that. Build heuristics. Launch and, and look into your team information. Team logs a lot. Uh, instead of worrying about finding data outside for your problem statement. Design your product with all the metrics to be embedded into that on the day one. 
and create some decision making process for the predictions which machine learning create identify the predictive power with features and obviously test the model very very well before you even validate it and have your ideal outcome beforehand understand there is always a bias which goes into your models have humans in loop maintain the freshness of the system launch and iterate the product continuously and typically test it as you are the third uh, uh, in the way that you are not the only person testing the system this is what i always say machine learning is a prop it's not the entire product if you look at the cake i buy that cake for the icing on the cake or the design on the cake but i will eat that cake only if it is actually tasty the reputation value of that is if the taste cake is actually baked properly or it it tastes properly so your machine learning will make people to buy that but it's it it's not something which is defining your entire product treat it that way and make sure that it is just a prop and make sure that your project or your product has paramount important and obviously to create that edge of your product over others machine learning has a lot of value so let me take you through the practicality of how we've designed this or or how features actually changes or or creates a change within your company so i'll be monitoring question and answers if you have any questions but do let me know if you have any now let's take a problem statement where i wanted to show you a a model where you wanted to identify with all the pictures whether you have a, a picture of i mean you have a ton of pictures i wanted to understand which pictures has uh, which pictures are pizza or not what are what are the pictures of pizza here or what are not now the first thing is i split my entire data into like 80% for training and obviously 20% for testing as we said we are going to do this for testing now when you train the model typically imagine you take a feature which is which you think of out of box the features can be like it can be baked it has meat it has it is cooked in pan for example i took features where it has anything with red sauce cooked in pan is going to be a pizza imagine and uh, i am training the data for 92% training accuracy and let's see how it actually works in the test so if you look at that kind of model gives me like 75% data accuracy so why it is not accurate here what i'll actually try and tell you is splitting you can choose to split i would typically go for 80 20 always but you can choose the training data and testing data also changes the way the model actually behave now once this is what i wanted to you to understand very clearly is if you look at the features so what we said is anything red sauce and a cooking in a pan is going to be a good pizza but that's not the case always may we think creatively here where you wanted to say hey i wanted to define carbs and anything which is round have a lot of carbs maybe can be a pizza nothing wrong in that for example what i'm saying is i'm selecting carbs and round as my features in my model why i'm doing that because i thought this it would be the right solution to have uh, uh, to be incorporated in my uh, model which which is nothing wrong so let's see how this goes when you test this okay and if you look at there is a lot of improvement in the data accuracy so what i am trying to say is the images are the same the training data set is also the same the split is also the same but what changes here is the features which you select that the predictive power which you bring on to the table i think this is the take away for this is you need to always think of how you can bring in the 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 features into consideration to make sure that the models are accurate and it's a thumb rule this is what i learned over a period anything you write rules for you can use machine learning mostly typically if you are very very new to ml and wanted to try understand where your problems can be solved 
this is the place where you can start with. Now, one ML is not a super ML. For example, you wanted to have a stock. Uh, uh, what is the stock on the supermarket? How many models you might need? There is a combination of models here. You're not trying to use one API or one model to predict everything. That's not how it works. For example, you wanted to see what, what stock goes out in the supermarket. You need to know the demand, you need to know the inventory, you need to have a restocking time, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to predict a lot of stuff and then actually use these predictions as a chain of events to create this impact of what is that uh, model look like. So never think of that, that there is one solution to this. Now, here is what I wanted to take you through. This is where I wanted to be more interactive is you can actually chat, uh, take time to chat. Let's say, this is a question for you all who are learning here. Let's say you are a meteorologist. So what you what, what the problem statement I give you is, I want you to predict weather trends and flight plans. For example, I wanted to, sim simple case, I wanted to see if my flight is actually taking off, whether it goes into turbulence or not. Now, how would you do it? Go ahead and chat. If you have a uh, quick, I'll give you just uh, 30 seconds. How do you solve this problem where I want you to predict if my flight actually is taking off, will be going into turbulence or not? Anyone? Okay. Looks like no one, but I'll try to answer that. Maybe uh, uh, chat if you have any kind of answers for this, but there are different ways to solve this. One of the best ways, obviously, is to collect a lot of weather data, predict that. I mean, that's a good way, it's nothing wrong. But here, machine learning is all about experimentation, finding the parameters which are unique and different, which your competitor doesn't have. Now, how do you do it? Maybe I'll go back to the basics where I'll tell you there are different types of clouds called cumuli numbers, cirrus. There are 10, to pl 10 plus different types of clouds. For example, cumuli numbers is associated with hurricanes. It is a dense cloud, whereas cirrus is more of open cloud. So there are, as a meteorologist, what I will do is I know there are different types of clouds and there is open data sets out in the market, which gives me the cloud data, like the cloud images. Now, what I do with this image, maybe those can be my data sources. Yeah, that's a great answer. Input weather flight patterns, uh, historical data wind patterns, all of them are right, exactly. Compare existing wind data. Yeah, I mean, come on, keep on getting, keep, keep coming with more and more answers. Yes, these are all excellent, uh, uh, different ways of actually solving the same problem. Now, I, I'll give you my solution. One, one thing which I thought will be useful is, Maybe I'm a novice guy. I don't know machine learning. I start with actually the data images of different types of clouds. And why not use them, which are public open? Now, what I do is imagine this is cumulative numbers and this is cirrus. When if I go to cumulative numbers, I'm going to have a very tough time. It's going to be a turbulent. Now, I can say this as a, as a weather guy, but imagine if I give it to any commercial API, this is what it gives you. It just says it's cloud, daytime, blue, atmosphere. So the commercial APIs are not designed for your use case. By the way, always look at if there is any API already in open. 80% uh, uh, of the times I have seen startups and products and companies trying to reinvent the wheel. Try if there is the approach which I generally take is put it into a commercial API and see if there is an answer coming out. No, here in this case, I don't have. Maybe the best option is I'll try to use services outside in the market, uh, maybe let's build a prototype. So I used one service from Google. You can choose to use any other service according to your choice. One service which typically I used is called AutoML AI. It's more of a autopilot mode or a service which can do multi-label classification with no coding experience. Thank you. So what I did is I imported all these images which are public put it into the service. I tried labeling them into different types of clouds. Here, if you see autocumulonus to autostratus, there are numbers. I trying to do that. 
and what I did is I just clicked the new train model. I can say I wanted to download this, continue. I can say for higher accuracy or better trade off, I'm okay. I'll set a node budget, which is like how many time, how many hours it can try and start training. So once I do this, I'll get a model like this where I can see the average precision or I can see the evaluation, how it is doing, what is the confusion matrix, uh, you know, what kind of precision and recall are there. So for every model I have built, it with the different uh, uh, taggings, I'll see a different pattern. So I'll take one of them and uh, deploy that and maybe upload image and see what kind of cloud it looks like. Oh, this is cumulative numbers. I have a model ready. Now I can download this, put it into a machine like or a, uh, or a small uh, hardware, which can take a picture which sits in the flight, which, which sits where the flight is taking off, take pictures of the clouds and immediately say, what is the probability of that flight getting into turbulence as in the cloud, as in the flight is taking off. This is one way of many ways you can think of. Now, this is easy to develop, easy to build, and maybe I can actually quickly iterate it to market and do, do a POC uh, rather than worrying about a lot of data, which is outside the market. This is one way of doing that. I mean, this is not the only way to solve it, but obviously out of hundred different ways, this can be a good way to start. So this is where I, I would love to have my company to see if the validation is done. And I know the cloud data here. I am a meteorologist. So I know how to test the validate the data. And I learn this from there and I try to tag or get better quality images, tag them properly and give them training one more time to see how the precision is improving. So I can reiterate multiple times when if, whenever I'm actually growing big and I have enough funding in my product, then I can actually include all what you said, like forecast, heat change, uh, historical wind patterns and, and the radar delays, current radar, all that information we I'll, I'll keep on collecting as in when I know that this is going to be successful. So it's like start small, grow big, iterate multiple times until you get a better model out of it. Now, uh, five minutes, yeah. Now let's final uh, a word uh, for, for me is in your organization, always maintain high quality data sets. Better have your infrastructure ready for machine learning, have a lot of compute, main, make sure that you have powerful tools at your disposal. Default everything open in your company. Your company should not actually have hold silos of informations within each other. Be protective, have governance, nothing wrong in that but at least make sure that people know different types of data is available within your own company. The reason is your employees does, you never know how employees come up with huge values, value sets out of your data, if they know what kind of data is available in your company. So create that model where everything is shareable within your company and create that, uh, 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 create that experience to employees that this is the kind of data available and see how beautiful different applications they come up with. Set up principles of AI in your org. Never take it for granted. AI comes with is an advanced technology. It empowers people, but it also comes with a lot of issues of bias, safety, accountability, privacy. So make sure that you have a principle in your organization to safeguard this. Do a valid a mandatory audit checks continuously in your organization. Make sure that you are you are doing it in the right way for next generations to use your products. And uh, yeah, I think. I'm just out of time and thank you very much for listening to me in this session.